Well, thank you once again for the invitation to be here with you, and uh, I do enjoy coming here. Last week we spoke on reconciliation and the basis of reconciliation, that is God, God's reconciling us to himself, and we also touched on reconciliation within ourselves. And this week we want to look at reconciliation and the ministry of reconciliation. Now, as we saw last week, among the Colossian Christians, there were signs of conflict. There were disputes over teaching based on popular speculation. And some people insisted on rules and regulations for the sake of rituals. And they tied their rituals to their, their own ethnic identity. And evidence is also portrayed in what Paul writes to the Colossians in chapter 3, verses 5 to 11. Paul portrays problems that dominated their lives before they became Christians. And these are the sorts of problems that demonstrate that ill will exists between people. And he indicates in Colossians 3, 5 to 11, that they have to put these things to death. In other words, strip them away from themselves. And he speaks in verse 8 of getting rid of things such as anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Now, what Paul is saying here is that words can change situations and relationships. They can heal or wound, and often irrevocably. Where bad feelings, animosity, discord, disagreement, strife, opposition, dissension and conflict occur, ill will is let loose in a community. So Paul urges the Colossians not to lie to each other because they are now renewed in God's knowledge and they are clothed in the image of, of God as creator. You see, ill will comes from inside. It begins with the spiritual. And people will use spiritual means to show their ill will. They may indirectly harbour hatred and bitterness. And so quietly rejoice when someone they do not like suffers. Or they may even directly seek some spiritual power through which they can control or even destroy another person. In Mark chapter 7, verses 20 to 23, Mark, uh, Jesus warned his disciples when he said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles. For it is from within... From the human heart that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within a person and they defile a person. So what Jesus is saying is that ill will comes from inside a person and is characterized by enmity, hatred, animosity, dislike, malice, hostility, displeasure, bitterness, resentment, discord, disagreement, strife, opposition, dissension, vengeance, bad feelings and conflict.
Now, I don't know if you knew that there were so many negative terms in the English language. You see, ill will is about the relationships between people and, and, and the spirituality of those relationships. It is depicted in Paul's distinction between spirit and flesh. In the concept, when I said ill will let loose in a community, in the concept of let loose, we are talking about feelings of hostility, destructive feelings, putting people down, marginalising others. It's the, the big boss, small boy syndrome. And the way people treat each other in these types of relationships. We're even talking about problems that can arise between people within a single ethnic group or between different ethnic groups. It is the whole problem that lies at the root of the distinction between blacks and whites. So ill will begins with the spiritual and it manifests in sin. Ill will is at the basis of conflict and this is a universal phenomenon. It's everywhere. Neither the church nor Christians are immune from ill will and the conflict that emanates from ill will. While I was working in northern Ghana, and you'll see I have northern Ghanaian cloth on today, while I was working in northern Ghana, difficulties arose between the church and mission over a number of issues. At one conference, at which both Ghanaian church leaders and missionaries were present, issues reached such an intensity that at one point, a church leader stood up and pointed to we missionaries and said, you behave just like your forefathers who sold us into slavery. Now, when someone says something like that, <laughs> you know there is a very serious problem that needs a response. As we heard last week, conflict leads to separation. And we saw last week that it is God who reconciles a person to himself through Jesus Christ. Paul helps us to understand that reconciliation with God brings a privilege and a task. And we see this in Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 to 29. The privilege, Paul discovered, is sharing with Christ in his suffering and work. That is the privilege that we have. And it's a beautiful privilege. The task is to bring people into a new discovery of the glorious hope of the gospel. So Paul himself says in chapter 1, verse 28, he proclaims, warns, and teaches everyone in all wisdom to present every person complete in Christ. God's good news is a free gift to us. It is meant to flow through us and beyond us to other people. It is meant for the blessing of all nations. It is part of God's great design for history. And Paul expresses the same ideas of privilege and task, but in a slightly different way, in what he wrote to the Christians in Corinth. And we see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 20. And I want to read those verses. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And it reads, So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them 
and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. You see, Paul reminds us that God reconciles us to himself through Christ. And then God gives to us a ministry of reconciliation. What is this ministry? First, it is the message that in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. It is to humanity, to humanity who has trusted the Lord, that God entrusts a ministry of reconciliation, that Christ died for the sins of all people, and that God desires healing in all the divisions that exist. The division with self, the division with others, and the division with creation. The ministry of reconciliation involves a message. And we've just heard what that message is. It's about Jesus. But the message is broader than just telling people that Christ died for their sins. It is expressed in Paul's words to the Colossians. In chapter 3, verses 12 through to 17. In Colossians 3, 12 to 17. And I want to read those words to you. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing hymns, psalms, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, the qualities that Paul speaks of here just flow one after the other. If we were all like what Paul portrays, the world would be much more peaceful. From what Paul writes, we see four points at the core of reconciliation with others. Four points. First, forgiveness, because Christ has forgiven you. Second, love, because it binds everything together. Third, the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts. And fourth, being thankful. We'll look at each one in turn. First, forgiveness, because Christ has forgiven you. For forgiveness to occur, there has to be an acknowledgement of wrongdoing. And usually there are two possibilities. First is when you have offended or wronged someone. You begin with yourself. You see, we need to acknowledge I too can do wrong. And the simple response to this is go and apologize. But it is very, very hard to say sorry. I find that. It's very tough to go and say sorry to someone. You see, the past affects the present. And when the leaders of a people sin, and the people do not reject that sin, then everyone is accountable before God. And that tells us that throughout history there are historical wrongs. In the 1960s and 1970s, the issue of the stolen generation among the Aboriginals first came to my attention. And there were discussions. And I remember listening as various governments came and went in Australia. 
it was very difficult for any government to come to the point of saying sorry, of acknowledging we have done wrong. Why? Most of them feared the issue of reparation. And finally, it took 40 years before Kevin Rudd had the courage to say sorry on behalf of the Australian government and people for a historical wrong that had been committed. Now, you see, it's important on an individual basis to realise the importance of saying, I'm sorry. Now, sometimes people reject it and say, you're not sorry at all. I've had people say that to me. And if they do say that, if it's rejected or it escalates, then use a mediator. Now, often we don't like to use mediators because we see it as a sign of weakness. And yet I have discovered in my own life the importance of using mediation. When I have had a difference with another person and the person would not accept the fact that I was sorry. Now, the second aspect of this is when someone wrongs you or causes an offence either to you or to others. If it is a personal offence, then make sure the, the offence occurred. You know, sometimes we hear things by gossip and talk. And the reality is the offence may not have occurred at all. And make sure that the offence is against you and not a third party. And we find that Jesus gave his disciples a model. And we see that in Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 17. And Jesus starts by saying, meet one on one. He says, if another member of the church, or in some translations, if your brother sins against you, go and point out the fault between the two of you alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one, that brother or that sister. So what Jesus is saying, this you do in private, face to face, if at all possible. It's not done through emails or SMS or Facebook or letters. And it's not done in an accusatory manner. In other words, you're not going as a judgmental person. You yourself are going open to listen, to hear their side of the story. Because that's the opportunity Jesus gave Adam in the beginning when he sinned. If the person is ready to... You have to also be ready to forgive the one who has wronged you. And if the accused is not defensive and open to listen and ready to apologise, the matter is resolved. So you don't go around broadcasting it and talking about it. But Jesus goes on in verse 16 and says, But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. In other words, he's talking about mediation, where you bring in upright, unbiased people not involved in the case. People that both you and the other party mutually respect. They're spiritually mature, gentle, empathetic and humble. And if this still does not bring reconciliation and the person is a member of the church, then bring in others from Christian fellowship. Jesus says in verse 17, if the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Now, when Jesus, when Jesus was on earth, the church didn't exist, as we know it. So in other words, he's talking about bringing in people from Christian fellowship. If the matter is still not resolved, then Jesus says, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, what is Jesus saying there? There are some who interpret this statement as Jesus saying, let go of the person, abandon the person. 
But I don't believe that is what Jesus is saying. Jesus, after all, made it very clear that he came to save both Jews and Gentiles. The very man who wrote this gospel, Matthew, was a tax collector whom Jesus called. And Jesus is not saying that the situation is utterly hopeless and therefore you give up on the person. Rather, I believe it is a call to win the person with love. In other words, the person may well be outside of the fellowship of Christians, but they are not outside the love of Jesus. And they never will be, so long as they exist. So it is a call to win the person with love. And while a person is still alive, we do not give up on their being reconciled to God and to others. In Jesus' eyes, no person is hopeless. That should be our view as well. And Jesus makes this very clear because he was called the friend of sinners and tax collectors. So that is the first point, forgiveness. Because forgiveness comes from Christ. Christ has forgiven you. The second point, love, because it binds everything together. Paul says in Colossians 3.14, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. In what Jesus goes on to say to Peter in Matthew 18, verses 21 to 22, demonstrates this love and the harmony that should result. Jesus was talking with the disciples, and then Peter came to him and said, Lord, if another member of the church or my brother sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times. And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Jesus gives clear steps in this chapter, chapter 18 of Matthew, of restoring harmony, uh, unity, and love. He instructs Peter to forgive a fellow believer 77 times. In other words, it's endless. And thus he inverts the rampant vengeance that Lamech boasted about in Genesis chapter 4, verse 24, when he boasted from increasing the killing from seven to 77-fold. Jesus reversed that. On the basis of love and forgiveness. Unlimited forgiveness and love lie at the very heart of Jesus' kingdom community. And we are the kingdom community of Jesus. Jesus goes on to tell a parable of a slave who owed a king a lot of money, but the king forgave him. And that slave then refused to forgive a man who only owed him a little. Jesus' key point in the parable is that whatever debt others owe us, it is completely incomparable to the debt we owe God. Jesus has provided the way for full forgiveness of our debt. His grace is boundless, and it is on this basis alone, therefore, that we forgive others and we love others. So that is the second point of the importance of of loving because it binds everything together. The third point is the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts. Colossians 3, 15. What contributes also to reconciliation is when we let the peace of God be the umpire in our heart. And the word for rule in that sentence is the word that means to be the factor determining an outcome. It's not rule as in rule over. It is in rule as in like an umpire. It is the word used of an umpire who settles matters of dispute. If Christ's peace is the umpire in a person's heart, when things clash, when we clash with others, and we're in dispute with others. Christ's peace keeps us in the direction of his love. And this is an ongoing part of reconciliation. 
This is Christ's discernment within us. The fourth point is being thankful. And it's mentioned twice in Colossians 3 and verse 15 and 17. And when a person lives in an attitude of thankfulness to God and people wrong you, it is much harder to get annoyed with them. It is much easier to forgive. Being thankful also lessens the likelihood of anger and maliciousness arising inside us. Now, I'd like to illustrate what I've said with a couple of brief illustrations from my own life. I worked for a secular organization when I was quite young, and a part of that, my responsibility was having to write papers, and the organization had particular ways of writing their papers, and I didn't like it. Now, that was arrogance on my part. And I handed a document in to the woman who was the editor. And she came back to me very annoyed and told me I had to change it. And arrogantly, I said that I didn't like the style. Well, she got pretty angry with me. And I came to realize that I had offended her. I changed the way the paper was written. I put in all the correct referencing. And I took it personally to her. And when I got into her office, she told me to get out, very bluntly. And she said, and don't leave the paper here. If you want me to get that paper, you can send it through a different route. No matter what I tried while I worked with that organization, she never spoke with me again. I got mediators in to try and reconcile between us, and she refused reconciliation. I left that organization, I was a Christian, I don't know if she was, I don't think she was, but I left that organization with deep sadness because it was, I was unreconciled. Mm. I've continued to pray for her throughout my life. I don't know if she's still alive or not. But there are situations that sometimes reconciliation doesn't occur. That's very sad. And we have to see that. The second example is also of another dispute I had this time while I was in Ghana with another Ghanaian Christian. And the Christian began to show signs in his behavior towards me of coolness. He would see me coming and he would move away. Or I would greet him and he would either not reply or it was a very brief reply. And finally I reached the point of where I went to his house one day, and I said to the person that I felt something was wrong, and I wondered what I'd done wrong. And very gruffly, the person responded and said, nothing. There's nothing wrong, that sort of thing. But I knew something was wrong. I didn't know what it was. I just kept praying about it, and it actually took some months before one day that same person asked me a question about something that had happened, and I knew straight away that it was the core issue that was the problem. But I knew that there was no way that I could go to him as an individual and the matter be resolved. So I had to find a Ghanaian person whom he respected to mediate between us. Now, this was very humbling for me. I'm the white missionary, you know. And yet, I got this man who both of us highly respected, and he mediated between the pair of us. And he mediated in such a way that both of us had to, in the end, admit certain wrongs that we had done to each other. We both had to express our forgiveness and accept the apology from the other. But that reconciliation brought a depth of friendship in our relationship that has continued even till, till now. The third brief example relates to this little book, which is called The Slave Trade and Reconciliation, A Northern Ghanaian Perspective, and it says edited by Alison Howell. Now, what I want to say is that, that this little book is the transcribed recordings of a one-day seminar that stemmed out of the accusation that the church made against us that we behaved 
like our forefathers who sold them into slavery. It was a very painful process that we ended up going through with the church. But it involved, it incorporated at least five different ethnic groups. It incorporated all our mission team and some of our missionaries were angry at the fact that the slave trade happened hundreds of years ago and their forefathers had nothing to do with it. You know, when somebody says, my forefathers came from Sweden, they weren't involved in the slave trade. But we kept on saying to them, that's not the issue. The issue is, our behaviour has been linked with something that's very painful in the historical memory. And so we asked members, church leaders in each ethnic group to do a little bit of research. Why in their own ethnic group? Because the slave trade had impacted northern Ghana. And I knew from history that northern Ghanaians had been sold into slavery and had been sold into the transatlantic slave trade. And then both church leaders and myself and one other missionary, we organised a one-day seminar in which each of those who did the research on their ethnic group, group presented their paper. I presented a little paper on the whole background history of the slave trade and its impact on northern Ghana. My fellow missionary looked at the whole issue of what was behind our accusation from a biblical perspective. Now, what happened that day was that during my fellow missionary's talk, he reached a point of where he stopped and he called out the leader who made the accusation. Then he got a bowl of water and he washed his feet. Now it stunned everybody, both missionaries and church leaders. During the seminar, I noticed a man, he was an older man, but he was a church leader in one ethnic group that had been heavily impacted by the slave trade, and I noticed him weeping, weeping constantly. After it was over, the church leader who had been involved in the organisation met with him and then he called me in and we had a discussion with it. And this man told us that he had fought with God the entire seminar. And the reason why he fought with God, he said, in my very ethnic group, people from another clan settlement sold my grandfather into slavery. And while he was walking 1,000 kilometres to southern Ghana, he tried to escape, but the slave raiders caught him and they cut off his four fingers off his right hand, leaving just his thumb. And by the time he got to Cape Coast on the coast, the British had declared the end of slavery in Ghana and the man was freed. And so he walked the whole way back, 1,000 kilometres. And when he got to his clan settlement, he showed them his hand and he said, never forget what they have done to us. And this church leader said, through the years, fighting and hatred has continued between our clan settlements. I have taught my children to hate them. And he said, today I fought with God. Now, we had no idea of the impact that a, a seminar that had to do with a wrong that had occurred with us would have such repercussions within the people themselves. At the end of the seminar, and I want to close with this, the man who led the seminar made a closing statement. It's a very brief. He said, today we have made a commitment. Whatever we agreed here, the Holy Spirit is a witness. If we leave here, we should remind ourselves every day that God is a witness to everything that we agreed upon at this place. It is my prayer we leave here rejoicing for what God has done in our lives. We will leave here to value each other, to work in unity, and to praise God. The family that prays together stays together. We will continue to meet and learn together in seminars, times of prayer, and that is the way we can stay together. If we meet together and pray and to discuss things like this, there is no room to gossip, there is no room for envy or hatred in our hearts. 
because our minds are preoccupied by prayer, love, unity, and sharing among each other. Amen.